Always. We ask the question. What is needed in the world? Holandski pisac i novinar sa samo 27 godina izlještavao je sa Balkana 90-ih godina, a tokom rata posjetio je dva puta Srebrenicu i o svojim iskustvima napisao je knjigu Najcrnji scenario. Pišući o intrigantnim društvenim i političkim temama u svojim knjigama čitatelje navodi na propitivanje ustaljenih stavova o društvenim normama. Dobitnik brojnih nagrada u Sarajevu je boravio na trećem međunarodnom festivalu knježevnosti Bukstan. S Frankom Westermanom smo razgovarali o ratnom izvještavanju, trenutnoj izbjegličkoj krizi, ali i budućnosti Evropske unije. Mr. Westerman, thank you for speaking to Al Jazeera. You have been in Sarajevo and Balkans during the war. Now, 23 years after you're here, what are your impressions now? It's fantastic to see the cable car working again. Uh, I was here during the war, Mount Srebovic, it was like the front line. I remember very well um, the bobsledge structures from the Olympic Games in 1984 and it was actually the front line. I spent a lot of time up the mountain but also downtown. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a city under siege. Uh, it was a city being slowly destroyed and trying to resist and to defend itself, uh, which they managed and then it's good to see that there is some signs of resurrection and uh, and liveliness and to be part of that is is just amazing you were uh, here and while you worked as a journalist you've been in srebrenica uh, before and during the fall of srebrenica you wrote two books one uh, uh, to 19, 1995 and the other 20 years later the first book was called srebrenica the blackest scenario and it was based on the secret UN documents and eyewitnesses and their interviews. So how did you get those documents and what was in, in it? Um, I used to work as a correspondent uh, based in Belgrade, but covering, well, actually Bosnia, Croatia uh, during the war. And of course, Srebrenica was one of the most important stories, even before the Dutch battalion came, of course. Uh, and um, uh, so I had the chance of following the tragedy as it unfolded from the people who got trapped uh, uh, in the valley of Srebrenica to um, the moment that General Morion declared UN headquarters from the post office of Srebrenica to the, to the, well, to the fall of Srebrenica, the, the, the mass killings and the aftermath. And what I did is actually, I, I think, apart from being a reporter, I spent two years trying to find uh, what happened. Uh, I worked for a newspaper that gave me time off just to do that. So... Uh, in what ways did you do that? In what ways? It was actually, um, um, I went to, to Tuzla, for example, um, where you had the archives of UN uh, activity, command lines, instructions, the document, the, it's actually the communication from July, let's say, 7 till 17, 1995. Uh, so you have several documents called SIT reps, situation reports. Um, you have the United Nations monetary, monitoring obse uh, uh, obser observations, UNMO is it called, who are basically not Dutch bad, but they were inside Srebrenica monitoring the situation. They wrote reports and um, uh, I remember very well there was a Pakistani UN uh, librarian in Tusla and I presented myself, I had this button press and I just asked for all the reports on July 15, well, t 10 to 15. And then, and then he, he looked at me and thought like, am I allowed to give this guy access to our information and I just stared at him and asked for it and then he nodded and then he came back and copied everything uh, so it wasn't illegal but I, 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 I think I wasn't supposed to get them. How did it felt for you to uncover the covered in Srebrenica and write about it? Yeah 
the, the, what emerged from the reports, if you, on a daily basis, from hour to hour, if you read what actually happens, um, uh, the, 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 the most tragic part to me is that the, um, the command of the Dutch battalion failed to report uh, what kind of atrocities were unfolding. They failed to, um, uh, I'm not saying they failed to protect the enclave, because that's a different story. They really depended on air power from NATO, and it didn't come, and they did ask for it. So there is one side of the story is that the Dutch battalion, they were not brave, and you can have, I have I'm, I'm very critical of their behavior. Um, I think they had uh, mid misjudged almost everything that could be misjudged. But you couldn't expect them on the ground to stop the troops of uh, Mladic because they needed the air power and they didn't get it in time. So then the real tragedy was that they closed their eyes and their ears and they still had the means to communicate. And you see the pictures of Pototzari with all the people around it as if they were people that almost drowned on the sea and they tried to, to hold on the Dutch battalion headquarters. And instead of protecting, instead of alarming the rest of the world that they couldn't really protect who they were supposed to protect, they uh, they shut the, the they shut the, the 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 blinds of the of the windows in their minds, and they turned it to a mode of survival for themselves rather for, than for the people. And I, if I read that, and I wrote wrote about it, it's uh, it's uh, it's coming home. It's I feel I feel I, I wasn't I, I wasn't part of the Dutch battalion, but as a Dutch. Uh, national I feel ashamed and I feel angry and I felt really the duty of trying to get the, um, the, the details out. You being here in this area uh, shows that it, it affected your further work in your life so last year you also came back and went to Mostar to do a documentary film called Bridge and you interviewed young people what was your premise there? Um, the idea of the documentary was, uh, I liked it because it was so simple. We had two presenters, two uh, interviewers, let's say, and we started on the bridge and we went each to another side of Mostar uh, with the same question. And the question was basically, uh, do you believe uh, every generation in the Balkans will have its war? which is a saying that I've heard over and over, so I didn't invent it, I think <laughs> it comes from here, that people tend to say to each other, there's no escape. So the question was, is there, a, is there an escape to fatalism, uh, to uh, we are going to have a next war, because it's about 25 years since we had our last one. Surprisingly, there was a different uh, answer um, uh, in in the age category so the older people were still very much uh, into believing it was inescapable younger people said no 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 we won't we won't fall into fall into that trap uh, well why not well they didn't know quite sure but w w well it's 21st century isn't it so we should be able to escape this 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 fatalism what I also discovered was that there was actually two groups of people, Croat, Croatian, Catholic, Bosnian, Islamic, uh, living with the backs towards each other, uh, uh, living apart from each other, uh, in a city that is still very much divided. And I was surprised how little of real interconnection there was, how exchange of... of, of um, you won't see it as a tourist, I think. Uh, you see the bridge, you see the competition of jumping from the bridge. It's very, very, very beautiful and it's good that there are tourists coming. Um, and I wondered, is it really a problem if, if the two communities uh, prefer to have as little contact as possible? Or is it a problem? Is it a problem in, is it a time bomb? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, because I, 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 
actually I'm afraid of politicians that try to pre predict what's going to happen because I think there's so many unpredictable things. Um, but it's, I was really surprised to see the extent of, 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 of separation. You were 27 when you were sent to Balkans to be a war journalist. Uh, how did you even become a war journalist in that age? And from this point of view, where are you now? Would you do something different? Or would you advise yourself to do something different back then? Um, I was young, I was maybe naive, but um, I, I remember um, uh, I couldn't fly to Belgrade because of the UN sanctions. There was no airspace, so I took a train from Budapest. I arrived at night at the railway station. I had, a, had an old fashioned suitcase, and the suitcase was filled with like uh, newspaper clippings and, uh, and books, and most of them were on like issues like nationalism, Danilo Kish. Uh, and, and, and they were useless, of course, because I, I had to report on a daily basis of what's going on. But um, uh, I, I told myself, uh, if you want to be a fair reporter, you, do, you shouldn't take sides. So in trying to be as fair as I could, I realized this was impossible. Um, impossible because, uh, well, one example, after, after a while I had a refugee in my home. And it was a, a, a deserter from the army, from the Bosnian Serb army, a boy that did not want to be drafted. And his parents were living here in Sarajevo. He was Bosnian Serb. And so he fled. He ran away to Belgrade. Wrong direction, because Milosevic was threatening to, to send him back. And deserters in wartime, they, have, they will be cannon fodder. They will be put in the front lines. So he didn't want to go back. He ended up in my apartment. And what I didn't know was that he was already um, um, uh, uh, cheated by the military police. Uh, uh, we leave you alone. I, we know you're living with the Dutch uh, journalist, but every Monday you come by and report on what foreign journalists like he and his friends are up to. So instead of having a refugee, I had a refugee slash spy. Uh, for three months in my apartment. What I want to say is that uh, even if you try to be neutral, you become part of it. Um, and I realized that my, uh, my, my um, uh, let's say, uh, my sympathy was with the underdog. I'm not saying this ethnic group or this political party, but with the underdog. And it was so, so interesting to see that in Zenica there were Bosnian Serb f families that were saying, well, we don't want war, we always live together with our neighbors, but we feel that we are suppressed. And I know you can't compare a family in Zenica to a Bosnian Muslim family in Banja Luka. I've seen Bielina, I've seen Srebrenica, that was the real ethnic cleansing. There were, it was life-threatening, but everywhere where a party was the, 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 the suppressed party, they were reasonable, they were nice, they were, uh, 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 they were aware of, they, they were, so, so the, your sympathy immediately, at least mine, went to the people that were suppressed. Uh, your approach as a writer is researching different subjects, uh, finding people and connecting them to historic events. How this journalistic approach helps your writing? Reporting is very difficult, I think. Uh, uh, difficult in the sense that um, um, uh, you miss out a lot. It's, it's like, it's like y you're only one person and, and you stumble uh, upon one story and you try to report it fairly and, and with, the, with the sense of how it is. Uh, the sense of the, the smell and the, 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 the devastation or the desperation of the people you meet, you try to give them a voice. Uh, but it's just, uh, it's just one, one, one little sample that you give at a time. Uh, writing books uh, gives you the opportunity, I think, uh, to, um, to do reportage and at the same time uh, think aloud. Uh, talk to what you what you find and try to make uh, to make uh, um, 
uh, to draw a line, a broader line of what's going on here, uh, what's my involvement, what am I doing here, uh, uh, how did it change uh, my views, uh, why, um, and 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 you can you can I think you can go deeper without making things more simple because they are not. Borders and boundaries is the main topic of this year's Bukstan. As we speak, 5,000 refugees are present inside of Bosnia and Herzegovina and thousands of them are knocking on the EU door. What are your feelings when you see these people and when you see the obstacles that they are going through trying to yeah. enter Europe? Uh, this, is, this, is, um, uh, uh, this is so strange to realize that even in Bosnia, where I have seen so many refugees, even, even, I mean, you, when I was a reporter, you, you come across people walking on the street with bags and you stop and ask what happened and they tell you, we have just left our village. We are now refugees. And you ask what they carry and they open their bags and you see what they take if you have 10 minutes or 15 minutes to leave. So um, uh, to, to, to realize that there are refugees again in, 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 in Sarajevo not right now and the duties of, uh, of a community like the European community to, um, uh, to accommodate or to, uh, to at least um, realize that, that it's, it's, it's also a common uh, responsibility to take care of, uh, of refugees it makes me worry because there is very little solidarity yeah, do you uh, think Europe lost its empathy there is so much concern about uh, local or regional or national uh, uh, problems um, that the uh, the broader picture of, of, of helping each other uh, Italy Greece but also Bosnia uh, has definitely gone to the second uh, or the, to the to the to, uh, to the sidelines, so that worries me. At the same time, the very essence of uh, of 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 having a multicultural of a multi-ethnic uh, society, uh, uh, I've been thinking that 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 identities are built uh, necessarily, uh, probably. Um, on knowing that there are other people too, so uh, so as so you had well take the example of Mostar, uh, Croatian side, Bosnian side. They define or redefine. Many people re redefine themselves on not being the other, and and so you stress what you think is your is yours, but you need the other. That's the nice thing. You can because if you. If you don't have the minarets at the other side of the river Neretva, and if you don't have the bell towers of the Catholic Church at the other side of the Neretva, then they are, they are reacting to each other um, in building identities. So in general, I think uh, society needs, uh, a group of people always need the other, even to feel home or to feel a group. You need so so it's, it's, it, it you lose something if you um, uh, if you try to create ethnically uh, homogene countries like in Hungary. Can this rise of the West Wing parties and the refugee problem inside of European Union jeopardize the project of European Union? The, the project is is definitely uh, is definitely in jeopardy, uh, but they have overcome some crisis big ones uh, uh, and 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 it, it depends it depends very much on on unpredictable factors like we we have in france we have macron as a president who is pro-european and we could have had uh, marine le pen uh, w which i think it would be would have been a different story so so and maybe, maybe, maybe uh, uh, the European Community will 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 actually um, grow because of uh, a trade war with the United States. Uh, maybe, maybe this is a factor that will merge 
uh, and, and re rekindle the spirit of being Europe, European. Uh, but it worries me. There was a point that which I, I like. I like the other approach, uh, the other way of thinking. Uh, as a child, I don't know. I think everybody does. As a child, when you write your address and your street and your city and your province and your country and your and then you end up with the universe, right? That's what children do. I did it too. Everybody did it. And the notion of Europe, which was somewhere in the middle was very weak. There was hardly any notion of being a European as a child. And, and now, I would, I would, if, I would, if I would make that list, the notion of European, being European, apart from the European Union, has some value to me. So, so over time, in my lifetime, it has gained value, and being Dutch has been, is, is, less, is less valuable. Uh, it's still valuable to me. Uh, so these, these, these things change. Uh, in your book, A Word, A Word, you wrote about and explained about how words can be stronger than bullets. So is there a possibility that we can create some counter narratives that can fight it? And what would be those narratives? I try to look for, uh, for a narrative based on dialogue and debate and fencing, but with words instead of fencing like with <laughs> real weapons and and uh, it's it's a strange situation because because we have uh, it's the, the book is written because do we have an answer to terror terrorism uh, like an answer in words and uh, i don't think um, uh, i'm not a pacifist i don't think we can do without uh, police forces uh, investigations uh, uh, try, uh, the anti-terror uh, uh, project, um, I don't think we can do without. Uh, but if you put emphasis on the struggle, the war on terror, then you lose something far more precious. And that's, that's actually the right to disagree, the right to not believe or believe differently, the right to, uh, to argue, to... Um, uh, so... so um, the words and debate and dialogue is, I think, an essential part. Uh, also, encountering uh, people who don't play by the rules and use weapons or hand grenades or bomb devices. Uh, I know you cannot stop uh, a suicide uh, bomber uh, by talking, but in the classrooms in cities like Rotterdam in cities like The Hague, uh, where, uh, let's say, a boy of 17 starts defending uh, the murder of Theo van Gogh in Holland, uh, you can send him off and say, you don't belong to this school because you don't subscribe to our, to our value system, or you engage him. If a boy of 17 in a classroom is engaged in a discussion on do you have the right to kill a filmmaker in broad daylight? Uh, uh, you, the boy of 70 still is not a terrorist. So this is the, the new battle line, the new front line where you, you can, use, can use language and ask questions or cause, cause doubt and, and see different shades and maybe crack a joke, why not? Uh, uh, saying, well, I mean, crack a joke. If you still can laugh, you're not a terrorist. In one interview uh, for your book, uh, Engineers of the Soul, of the Human Soul, you said that uh, history has showed us that artists are very important for propaganda and that propaganda is important for the survival of the regime. So how do you as a writer identify with this saying? Um, Yes, I mean, if you look at the, at, the, at the writers in the Soviet Union, even under Stalin, uh, they were very valuable to the system, which was, of course, murderous. I mean, the Gulag, uh, it was a ter state terrorism, Stalinism. Uh, and there was uh, part, of, uh, part of the artists forcibly, uh, and some part willingly, were supporting uh, a system that was totalitarian. Uh, which made me, of course, very humble 
and thinking about what we are doing as writers, as artists. Is it always for, let's say, um, uh, the good? Or can it easily be for, uh, for evil things? I think it can. So uh, history has shown that uh, a story in itself is not, uh, is not uh, benign. It can be very, very ugly. Uh, it can stir people into killing others. Uh, so it's not the story that is good or bad. But there is one element that I, I really like about, um, about storytelling and reporting and keep on doing so, is that you always invite your reader or your audience to think how the world would look like if you are on a boat on the Mediterranean, if you are a refugee in Sarajevo, camping outside in a park. If you, so so what, what, what stories do is inviting, inviting, inviting people to imagine how the world would look like from Mount Trevor Beach or uh, uh, from the city being bombed from Mount Trevor Beach. It is a huge difference if you're sitting up there and shelling people here or if you were on Markala markets and, and, and receiving the, the incoming uh, shells. There's a world of difference. But stories can invite you to imagine both positions. So what the stories, I think, do is that, that, that they, um, they train empathy. And I think empathy is a muscle or a capacity we have. And you need to train empathy. As, uh, without empathy, I'm not saying sympathy, I'm saying empathy, Without empathy, living together is very difficult. Thank you very much for speaking to Al Jazeera. Thank you.